All right, time now again for this week's College Football Report on Washington Radio, WLOV, Fox News Radio 810, and listenyourway.com. I'm Robbie Ross, joined by former Furman All-American lineman Corey Stewart. And Dr. Stewart, here we are again. Now it's week three of college football. I guess we need to look back at week two and some great, great football games. I was watching uh, College Game Day final from my hotel room in Charleston last weekend, and um, Reese Davis and Lou Holtz and Mark May were calling the Michigan Notre State Notre Dame game one of the best games in college football history. I kind of had a hard time wrapping my mind around it, but when I watched the highlights, I kind of agree with them. Yeah, can you believe how that ended? Uh, we we just got out of our game, and I caught the tail end of it. And I, I you watch that football game uh, multiple times. And you do have to ask yourself if that was one of the better finishes in the history of college football, uh, Robbie. I mean, uh, what was it, 28 points scored in the last uh, two minutes of a football game, and they were extremely long drives, 70, 80 yards plus. Uh, the two seconds left in the game, and uh, Michigan throws the fade pass in the corner for the uh, touchdown. I mean, it was it was a great weekend all around. I mean, that was one of only a handful of games that ended up coming down to the last second. It's uh, for all the off field problems that college football had this off season. Uh, the product on the field has never been any better than it is this year. And it seems that Denard Robinson, quarterback for Michigan, seems to just show up for at least one game per year, and that's always Notre Dame. <laughs> yeah, he, he seems to have their numbers right. He, He'll show up this that weekend, and then uh, two weeks from now, when they play a big game, he'll fall off the charts. But uh, you know, he's an impact player. He's he's that new breed of quarterback, the guy who can run and throw. Um, but he's that he's a college player at the next level. Uh, he'll be like an Armani Edwards was at App State. I mean, he's he was going to be a wide receiver or a special teams type guy. But for those four or three special years he gets to play at Michigan, you know, he's a superstar, and that's that's what makes college so much better and different than. The NFL is that finite period of time these guys have to be uh, the big man on campus, and uh, when they take advantage of it, it's something special. And uh, a little closer to home, Georgia, South Carolina, back and forth, back and forth. We were uh, keeping up with that one on our phones uh, during the Citadel Furman broadcast that we were a part of. And uh, South Carolina jumps out, has all those defensive touchdowns, and uh, Georgia kept battling back, but the, the old ball coach finally got it done, and South Carolina now sitting really pretty at 2-0. and Georgia is uh, in panic mode at 0-2. Yeah, speaking of you falling on your phone, I couldn't tell if you were spotting for me or you were spotting for the Georgia-South Carolina game while I was trying to call <laughs> ours. But, uh, you know, I won't hold it against you. It was, it was a pretty fantastic finish out there. And, uh, you know, we talked about it last week. If Mark was 0-2, what, what would his prospects be going forward? And I think, uh, you know, saying he's sitting on a hot seat is an understatement at this point. Um, I certainly wouldn't envy being the Coastal Carolina team this week if, uh, I was going to Athens. I'm pretty sure they're going to be that Georgia team's going to be fired up and looking for their first W of the year. But um, Athens is certainly uh, a little bit of a hotbed right now because no one really understands why their team's 0 and 2. They played very well the last two weeks. They just self destructed. You look at the Georgia game, I and mean, they had that thing wrapped up by two touchdowns, and then the pick six by Murray, and then the fumble on the sack play. Um, those two, you take those out, and Georgia wins. But that's why South Carolina won the East last year. That's why a lot of people have them as a dark horse for a BCS title game. Uh, they just find ways to win football games. Uh, you know, that's Spurrier has had dominating teams in the past, but even when the teams weren't dominant, they always found ways to to make the ball roll their way. And they did that against Georgia. Uh, you know, Georgia did a good job. They shut down Alshon Jeffrey. He only had about, I think it was 84, 84 yards for in one touchdown. Um, you know, the one thing that I think Georgia should do is stop scheduling South Carolina the second game of the season. It seems every year they do that, they end up being in a tight battle and losing in the end. Well, I guess that comes from the SEC office. And, and, and you mentioned that South Carolina now, I don't, I don't believe, without having their schedule in front of me, South Carolina does not have to play any of the monsters from the West. They don't play LSU. They don't play Auburn. They don't play Alabama. I think they got Ole Miss and Mississippi as their two crossover games from the SEC West. So now all you have to do is just take care of business in your own division, and you're sitting pretty in Atlanta. Yeah, and if you look at the SEC East right now, uh, it really comes down to South Carolina and Florida. I mean, Tennessee has shown some improvement, and uh, they have a huge game, obviously, this weekend in Gainesville. But 
uh, it'll come down the way it did last year, which was that Florida-South Carolina matchup. But I think right now South Carolina has the advantage given the uh, returning experience they have, the strong running game they have. I think Lattimore in the last two games has rushed for over 150 yards. He's time, he's touched it. And, uh, you know, in the SEC, having a dominating running game could be the difference maker. And uh, you talk about South Carolina. This week they have Navy on the schedule, and uh, they open a four-game homestand. I, I stand corrected. I pull up there. They do have Auburn on the schedule uh, at home in two weeks. So uh, they're looking at Navy, Vanderbilt, Auburn, Kentucky, Mississippi State, Tennessee, and then they have to go to Arkansas, which could be a little of a hiccup. And then they have Florida, the Citadel, and Clemson at home. So uh, they play four home games in a row, go on the road for three games, and come back and finish up at home. But the last time they played Navy was 19. 19- 1984, and they were undefeated going into the last game or second to last game of the season before Clemson and Navy beats them up in uh, up at Navy and ruins what could have been a potential uh, undefeated season. And they had the quarterback Todd Ellis. So uh, Navy, a little bit of history for South Carolina. Yeah, the the middies are coming in here. They off of uh, I think they're up to a two and zero start right now. But uh, I mean, this is a high powered South Carolina team. You know, back in '84, back in you know the early '80s, Navy was still able to produce some pretty solid uh, football programs. Uh, not to say they aren't now, but I think South Carolina. Um, Spurrier's got this team a little more focused than he think he's had in the past. I don't know what they're doing down there, what they're putting in the water in Columbia, but these guys are playing a high breed of football right now. They're very opportunistic, as you can see from the Georgia game. They create turnovers and Navy running the triple option. Uh, that's a uh, highly prone to turning the football over. South Carolina, obviously, with that SEC speed, uh, they get their hands on a loose turnover ball, like we saw on Saturday in Athens. They can turn easily turn into six points. So, uh, you know, the one factor is you don't see the triple option in the SEC at all. So it could be a, it's an interesting matchup to keep your eye on. But I think it's one of those that by the third or fourth quarter, South Carolina pulls away, and uh, it ends up being a laugher. And uh, you look at. Um... Other games around the country last week, Auburn and Mississippi State, that was quite a battle too. Auburn, uh, we were watching that uh, in your hotel room beforehand and uh, watching that one, and Auburn was in control. Then Mississippi State looked like they scored a touchdown on replay. It it looked like he broke the plane. Yeah, I still don't know how you got into my hotel room, but I let you come in once you knocked on the door. Well, the secure I couldn't get up to your – the elevator wouldn't let me get all the way up. You had to send your uh, your assistant down to let me in the elevator because the, the whole floor was locked down because Corey Stewart was on the seventh floor. Well, sometimes I have to travel with my entourage. It's just it's, – it's the nature of being a high-profile celebrity. But going back to the, the that game, we did watch the tail end of it there um, – and he got a he got a feel for Dan Mullen and Mississippi State. I mean, to lose on the one inch line, essentially, on a quarterback dive play with essentially with no time left on the clock. I mean, it was such a great football game. Auburn, that's two in a row now, two games that have come down to the absolute wire for him, and they found a way to win. And that goes back to them being a national championship team a year ago. They know how to win close games. They know what it's like to be in a tight situation. But uh, you know, that's that's kind of what I was saying at the top of this was the. The programs right now in college football are producing some of the best games we've seen in quite some time. I mean, this is two or three weeks into the season, and every week there seems to be one of these games that comes down to the very end. And, uh, you know, it's it's just the nature of what we've talked about before the season started, which is the diversity in college football now. All the different programs, you no longer have, uh, you know, 10 or 15 power schools that get all the blue-chip players. They, they get dispersed across the country, and... Uh, you know, that helps these mid-tier programs produce some pretty good teams. So, uh, you know, anytime two SEC teams face each other and it comes down to wire, it's always an entertaining contest. And uh, looking back, so, I mean, that's uh, Mississippi State was going to be the dark horse in the Western Division. Now they're at 0-1 in the West and got a huge game tonight against LSU. Uh, you know, L- at home, though, Mississippi State's going to have to somehow – strap up the boots and uh, come to play against LSU or else they're going to be 0-2 in the league and that'll be all she wrote. Yeah, but the power of the cowbell on a Thursday night in Starkville, I mean, that's a spooky place to play. If you've if you've ever watched a game at Mississippi State or if you've ever had the privilege of being at a game at Mississippi State, I mean, it's it's pretty loud. How they get away with letting 60,000 people bring in cowbells from the country is beyond me, but uh, you know, like you, you and your friend Les Miles seem to find a way to get out of sticky situations. So it'll be an entertaining game to watch for sure. I'm glad it's a Thursday night game. Absolutely. And uh, looking around uh, the the ACC now, uh, big game. Uh, 
in the conference. So a lot of big games out of the conference for the ACC this week. Auburn, Clemson, Florida State, uh, Oklahoma, Ohio State, Miami. Uh, not really any conference action yet as they're still playing their out-of-conference schedule. Yeah, absolutely. Right now the ACC is actually on more people's radar talking about the conference realignment and how – Texas has all of a sudden popped up as a possible addition to the ACC if the Big 12 inevitably falls apart. So, uh, you know, the ACC has a couple of good teams out there. I mean, the problem is some of their other programs are just getting run over. Uh, last week, Boston College being manhandled 30-3 to by uh, Central Florida. So, the ACC, I think tonight, the, the big game, obviously, on Saturday, Florida State versus uh, uh, Oklahoma. Um, that's a rematch of the 2000 National Championship game, if you recall, with Josh Heupel coming down to the Orange Bowl and beating Bobby Bowden. But, uh, I mean, that's, it's nice to see that Florida State is back in the spotlight. Um, you know, it's, it's hard not to see them not ranked in the top ten. So uh, it's going to be a good contest, and it's a lot of good football this weekend. And uh, Clemson and Auburn, that'll be a big one. Uh, of course, last year Clemson was up big. That was the first comeback win for Cam Newton of many to come last year over the Plains in Auburn, and they have them in Death Valley tomorrow, uh, Saturday at, uh, I think that's a 12 o'clock kickoff, and then uh, Ohio State Miami, not really sure uh, what Ohio State's going to bring to the table, not really sure what Miami's going to bring to the table. We saw them lose to Maryland week one, uh, so the ACC, there's only been a, a hand, two conference games so far, as uh, Wake Forest beat NC State last week, and of course Maryland beat Miami in week one, so uh, they're still settling things out of conference-wise, and, and uh, you know, a lot of undefeated teams in the, in the ACC still. Georgia Tech, North Carolina, Virginia, Virginia Tech, Clemson, and Florida State all have yet to lose, and, and including Maryland as well. Yeah, the ACC still has a lot of room to uh, shuffle out a little bit. And, you know, you talk about Miami. They actually get a lot of their suspended players back for Saturday night's game. Jacoby Harris is back. Uh, Steve Smith is back. So uh, a lot of these – a lot of what we saw in the Maryland game – they're going to be a different football team when Ohio State comes to knock on Saturday night, a nationally televised football game. Um, you know, I've heard some interesting names for this bowl, <laughs> for this game, given it the ineligible bowl or, you know, the Tats and uh, Exotic Dancers Bowl. I mean, kind of going back to all the suspension these guys have had the last few uh, months. So uh, that game's in the limelight probably for a lot of the wrong reasons, and, uh, but it'll still be an entertaining contest. But, you're yeah, right. The ACC still has a lot of room to shake out. Um, you know, right now you're looking at North Carolina's playing exceptionally good football, uh, which is surprising given the departure of Butch Davis so early before the preseason even started. But that was a team that came back pretty loaded. Um, and their quarterback, Brand, is actually having an incredible season right now. I think he's thrown over 70%, and their receiver, Dwight Jones, has already gone over 400, almost 300 yards receiving. So uh, they're, a, they're a team to keep your eye on right now. The ACC usually shakes itself out late in the season, but. Uh, it's certainly going to be an interesting contest going down the road. And uh, it's time once again, as we do every week, to go to our college football picks. Last week we were both 3-2 and two, uh, in our picks. And so for the year, after two weeks, I stand at 6-4 and four, and you stand at 4-6. and six. So there's a two-game swing still. I still have the lead in the two games uh, there. So um, we're going to start off this week with tonight's big matchup in the SEC West, LSU and Mississippi State. Who you got? Well, like I said, you look at that ball game, and everything points to LSU being a favorite football team by at least two touchdowns. But I got to say, the way Auburn, the way Mississippi State played at Auburn last week, the fact that they're at home in Starkville, I think I, I I'm going to say Mississippi State. Now I'm playing in the hole a little bit here. I'm having to throw a couple hair marys up, but I think you got to go with Mississippi State in this one. I think if you watch that football game Thursday night, has traditionally been an upset night in football, especially for the visiting team, higher-ranked team. Uh, you look back a few years ago, it seemed every Thursday night on ESPN, a high-ranked team was going down at somebody else's house. So uh, I think tonight's the night that'll happen. Dan Moulton's team plays everybody tough when they're in Starkville, and tonight will be no exception. I'm going with uh, I'm going with Mississippi State too. I like that pick. I think Mississippi State with their backs against the wall and all those cowbells and they'll all be all probably having a whiteout or something like that. You know, I like that as well. So Mississippi State going to stay in the West Division race and uh, possibly knock LSU out of the national championship race. Uh, let's move ahead to Saturday: Auburn and Clemson. Big uh, big game there for Clemson. They're two and zero. Survived Wofford last week, and um, it could be a real big statement game. And I think there uh, next week there's Florida State on the schedule, so Clemson looking to keep momentum. I'm going to go with the Clemson Tigers to uh, to get the win at home. 
know, this is actually an interesting matchup when you look at it, Robbie, because you talked about last week Clemson having to score some late touchdowns to beat Wofford. They ended up only beating them by seven points. Uh, Auburn, two weeks in a row now, they've come down to the wire. They, they really stole the game from Utah State. They had no business scoring those two touchdowns and then getting the onside kick. So, uh, you know, that, that game really was, in, was a loss that they just stole out of the grip of Utah State. And then last week holding on against Mississippi State. So, you know, logically you look at it and say, hey, Clemson's got the advantage. But I think Auburn's got the better athletes. Um, Michael, Michael Dyer in that backfield, he rushed for 150 yards last week. Uh, he's coming into his own as their feature back now. Uh, you look at them on defense, they put a lot of pressure on people. And, you know, Demo Sweeney's teams have historically not played well when they've been in a big football game, when they've been in the limelight. So I'm going to take Auburn here. I feel the SEC is always going to be better than the ACC, at least for the time being. So i got to stick with the SEC. And uh, this game that we talk about next has kind of lost its luster over the past few years, but it was always a huge, huge game in the SEC East. Uh, every year, first game, conference game for both teams, Tennessee and Florida. Uh, of course, Florida with their new coach, Will Muschamp. Uh, they're at 2-0. and Tennessee with their second-year coach, Derek Dooley. Uh, they're at 2-0 and as well. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see. This game is, is back to on the, on the radar as a huge game in the SEC East. Who you got in that one? Yeah, this, this actually used to be the game that everyone looked forward to in the SEC back, I think, from 1992 to 99 or 2000. These two teams were the only ones who ever won the SEC East, uh, I think, for a nine- or ten-year stretch there. And, and it went back, really, they always played each other the first SEC opener of the year, and it always kind of set the tone for the rest of the season. Um, and, and it's a game that, in all honesty, game day was always there, and uh, it even goes back to 2001 when they had to move it back because of uh, 9-11, and they played it uh, a week into uh, December. And Tennessee beat the number one-ranked Florida Gators going down there with uh, the Iceman, Casey Clawson. So uh, it's, it is a game, though, unfortunately, it's fallen off, but I think it's back this year. Uh, I, in all honesty, you look at Florida, they have better numbers. Their tailbacks with uh, Dempsey and Rainey. Uh, they have a chance to run all over a Tennessee defense that has struggled to stop people this year, but... Uh, I look on the other side of the ball, and Tennessee's offense with Tyler Bray has been extremely effective. Uh, I think he's completing 70.4% of his passes right now. He's thrown for over 300 yards both games this year. Uh, that was a Cincinnati team last week that came in, gangbusters trying to win that game, and Tennessee beat him by 20 points going out. So uh, I think Vince, or I think Derek Dooley finally gets his first big road win of the year, and Tennessee beats the Gators in the swamp. I'm going to take Florida. So uh, there's our, our second difference uh, of, of the week. Let's go Oak. Ohio State, Miami. Uh, I, it's hard to go against the Buckeyes after all they've been through, and, and this is a big statement game for their new coach and their kids. I'm going to go with Ohio State. Well, I would take Ohio State under normal circumstances, but I think with Miami getting Jacoby Harris back, getting Spence back, getting some of these guys off suspension, um, some of the media hype dying down from the off the offseason uh, issues and the hype around the the scandal of all the players receiving those extra benefits. I think they come out, they try to prove something on Saturday night. Ohio State is not as good as they were. I think this team, you know, they they snuck by Toledo last week by one touch, by one point, uh, up in the big house. Well, not the big house, the big shoe. And so, um, you know, it's 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 a game where I think Miami, in a, in a spotlight, they're going to come out and play well, so I'm going to take the Hurricanes. And uh, the last game of the week, Florida State, Oklahoma. Oklahoma number one, Florida State number five. Uh, both teams, uh, you know, up and coming in the top five, really. Uh, of course, they have the past tradition, uh, but Oklahoma uh, last year didn't fell off a little bit. Florida State trying to rebuild under Jimbo Fisher. Uh, Going to be a huge, huge game uh, uh, Saturday night. Who you like uh, in the top five matchup? Yeah, this is a game, like we said earlier, it goes back to the 2000 National Championship game, Oklahoma-Florida State. Um, Bob Stoops, it's crazy to think he's been in Oklahoma for as long as he's had. I think he's going into his 12th, 13th season. But uh, this is one of, probably one of the best Oklahoma teams he's had in a while. And if you think about all the Oklahoma teams he's had there in the mid-2000s that went to the National Championship games and just got annihilated by people, um, this is one that actually I think could compete with an SEC program. Florida State being a pretty darn good athletic football team right now. Um, i, I got to go with the Sooners. I think they're going to play well on the road. They have Florida State's number last year. They blew them out in uh, Oklahoma out there in Norman, and pretty much it was a laugher uh, going into the fourth quarter. I don't think it'll be a laugher this week. I think it's going to come down to the wire be another great football game. But 
Uh, I take Oklahoma in this one. I'm taking the home team, the Seminoles at night with all those tomahawk chops. I'm going with the Seminoles to win it. So, uh, you know. Ooh, you're, you're, you're jumping out on some legends this week. I am. You know, you got to be a riverboat gambler sometimes. So, uh, we agree on one game, Mississippi State. We both think they're going to pull the upset tonight. So, uh, uh, be a, a big game, a big week for us going against each other. And, and uh, you know, I, I hate to say it, you're not going to be able to see my smiling face this week as Furman's off. So, are you going to be able to survive that? Well, we can always Skype each other or, you know, I'll mail you a postcard from Atlanta. Anything anything to stay in touch with you, Dr. Ross. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Stewart. And uh, as always, great job. And uh, thank you again for joining us on the College Football Report. We do it every week. We will look forward to it next week. All right, that's Corey Stewart, former Furman All-American. I'm Robbie Ross. This has been the College Football Report on Washington Radio, WLOV, Fox News Radio 810, and listenyourway.com.